2 Peter 3, and we're going to look as we begin this morning in verses 5 through 7. Now, uh, the Apostle Peter has been warning the church about the scoffers that were in the church at that particular time. They were scoffing at the fact that Christians believed in the second coming of Christ and that there was a judgment to come. And their basis of their, their beliefs were that basically there, there has been no judgment up until that point. You remember back in the previous passage that we looked at, it said there that they believe that all things continue as they were from the beginning of time. Now, Peter is about to refute that idea, that concept, that all things continue as they were from the beginning of time, because they haven't. And he says this in verse 5, For this they willfully forget, that by the word of God the heavens were of old, and the earth standing out of water and in the water, by which the world that then existed perished, being flooded with water. But the heavens and the earth, which are now preserved by the same word, are reserved for fire until the day of judgment and perdition of ungodly men. So what was their error? Peter makes it clear here. They are willfully forgetting the flood. Now that proves that all things do not continue as they always have from the beginning of time. This is a worldwide judgment that came upon this earth and that all of those that lived at that time except for eight people perished. And that is an issue that they have to come to grips with. It's an issue you have to come to grips with. Now you say to yourself, well, how do we know that that took place? Well, there is plenty of factual evidence, and we're going to look at that this morning. But notice here in verse 5, it says they, were, they willfully forgot this. They willfully forgot it. Now, the word willfully means to wish or to determine to hide from view. So a person makes a willful decision to hide from view certain facts. So when a person does that, they're setting them up themselves up for a fall. This willful rejection of these facts, well, I believe that this takes place today in our school system right now. You read the, the history books, you read the science textbooks from junior high on all the way through college, and you say, well, are you sure? Yeah, I've sat in those classes. I know that these facts are hidden. They are removed from the textbooks. Scientists don't believe that there was a great global flood. And any scientist who states that they do believe in intelligent design or they believe in a worldwide flood, they are castigated they are ostracized and they are expelled from their positions. You say, well, I doubt that, Steve. Well, just watch Ben Stein's movie, Expelled. You can find that on Netflix or on DVD someplace. Many people probably here in this room have it. Watch it, because he speaks about individual scientists I mean, very well-known scientists that we have shown in videos here that believe in intelligent design, they believe in a worldwide flood, and when they spoke and they printed some articles in science periodicals, they were expelled. They lost their jobs. So if you don't think that is being purposely, willfully hidden from your eyes, you're kidding yourself. It's a reality. And Ben Stein wanted to expose this, what is taking place in our educational system today. So some of you today have never heard the information I'm going to share with you today, right now. 
You've never heard this. And it, yet, it is factual evidence that you cannot turn your eyes away from. And yet, some choose to do that. So what I want to do is I want to just look at the facts, and then you judge. You make a decision. You make a determination. But to hide those facts from people, or to cherry-pick facts out of science or history, that's just not being truthful. That's not right. Give everybody all the facts and let them make their own decision. But that's not happening today. So what's the factual evidence for Noah's flood? Well, first there is historical evidence for the flood. Good historical evidence. The first historical fact is simply the statement of Jesus, who was an historical individual. He lived, and he claimed to be the Son of God and proved that he was the Son of God by his miracles and by his resurrection. So the Bible is an historic document. It's historic literature. And it declares this. In Matthew 24, verse 37 through 39, it says, Jesus said, but as the days of Noah were. So Jesus obviously believed in a real guy named Noah. But as the days of Noah were, so also will the coming of the Son of Man be. For as in the days before the flood, so Jesus believed in a flood. They were eating and drinking, marrying and giving in marriage until the day that Noah entered the ark. Oh, Jesus believed in an ark too. And did not know until the flood came and took them all away, so also will the coming of the Son of Man be. So you have a decision you have to make. You have to decide, do you want to believe what some scientists teach? Or you want to believe Jesus Christ? Which do you want to do? Now, you remember, about 500 years ago, scientists told us that the world was what? Flat. So scientists can be wrong about facts. You remember when individual scientists in the 1800s started to say that there was such a thing as bacteria. Well, those scientists were ostracized as crackpots. There was no such thing. Yet today we know that there is obviously bacteria that can kill you. And microorganisms need to be cleansed from medical tools or they transmit that bacteria to you. But that has not always been the case. And so you have to decide. Jesus is either telling you the truth or he is a liar or he's a crackpot. He's a lunatic. Those are your only options. It's the truth or it's a lie. Or he is someone who is deranged. So that's the decision you have to make. I choose to believe what Jesus said that there was a man named Noah, there was a flood, and there was an ark. And we'll go into more of those details as we go along here. So it either happened or it didn't. The second piece of historical evidence I think is also incredibly powerful. And that is the flood legends that you will find in every culture around the world. You say, well, is that really true? Yes. If you're interested, I can send you the document. I can't print it for you because it's 100 pages long. But if you want it and you want to read the different flood legends, just email me and I'll send it back to you. It gives you the account of the flood legends from every people, every tribe, every continent on the face of the earth. In Europe, you have a Greek flood legend, Roman, German, Celtic, Akkadian flood legend. In the Near East, you have the Egyptian, Babylonian, Assyrian, Chaldean, Persian flood legend. 
Africa, every tribe in Africa, from the Maasai's to the Pygmies, have a flood legend in their written documents. Asia, the Mongolians, Russians, Hindus, Chinese, Korean, all have a flood legend. Here in the United States, all the way from the Eskimos and the Inuit peoples in Alaska to the Blackfoot, the Cree, the Cheyenne, the Cherokee, the Navajo. Every single one of them has a flood legend. Central America, all of the Indian tribes from the Mayans to the other Indian tribes there. South America, the same thing. Every single tribe, every single people. Now, I ask you, are they all wrong? That's the conclusion you have to come to. Where they, are they all wrong? Now, how did they all get those flood legends into their histories when they're all separated by large ocean oceans that cover the earth? How did that happen? They can't transmit that information to each other. So how did they get it? Because it happened. That's how it happened. Now, all the flood legends are very different in the way that they are described, but they have the key points in them. That the wickedness of man was great. There was a God, by whatever name they call him, that sent a flood, and certain people were saved from that flood. And everyone else perished. That are, those are the, the key elements of the flood legends, and they're in every single one. That's historic evidence that you probably have never heard. But if you want to read them, it's very interesting reading. Email me and I'll send it to you. Now next, the archaeological and scientific evidence for the flood is really overwhelming. Now, the first piece of evidence is the large amount, the enormous numbers of fossils that are found all around the world. Do you realize that there are literally billions upon billions of fossils that people have found all around the world, all around our globe? Now, how did those fossils get there? Now, if a fish or an animal is fossilized in the ground, how did that take place? It requires a cataclysm. It requires catastrophe. It doesn't happen otherwise. Now, when a fish dies or an animal on the land dies today, what happens to those animals? Well, if it's a fish in the sea, it gets picked apart by pelicans or seagulls, or it sinks to the bottom of the ground or the bottom of the ocean, and it is eaten by crabs or lobsters or any other crustacean that's on the bottom of the ocean. And it disappears. It's not fossilized. When an animal dies on the, on the land, it's not fossilized. It rots or it decays or it's eaten by another animal. It's not fossilized. Why? Because it requires a cataclysm. It requires a catastrophe. So, let me give you, without giving you all of the scientific data for this, let me just give you the three biggest ways and reasons why animals are fossilized. The first is because fossils require a rapid burial of land or sea animals covered and compacted by water. And so an animal would die and then there is, they are covered over by sediment and it is then compacted and pressurized and the imprint of that animal is left in the, in the dirt. It is hardened into rock and that is why we find them today. A second way that animals are fossilized is through freezing. As you find woolly mammoths and uh, woolly rhinoceroses in Antarctica, in Alaska, in Siberia. They have been quick frozen. 
And they dig these things out all the time. They dig them out. There's still skin on the carcass. There's still hair on the carcass. There's still tropical vegetation in their guts. And you say, okay, how do you get tropical vegetation in Siberia? Because at one point, Siberia, at one point, Antarctica and Alaska were tropical areas of the earth. So that means that something radically has changed on our planet. And so these are what you find. The third way of fossilization is by asphalt. Now, we have one of the most interesting uh, tar pits right here in Los Angeles. In just a few hours from here, I hope, I hope you've all been to the La Brea tar pits and gone through their museum. Very enlightening. I'll tell you, you can see some of the most incredible animals that they have pulled out of these tar pits. Now, I've seen pictures from the early 1900s, and these tar pits are just basically just pools that are separated, of several pools, and they're just bubbling crude. And in the background, you can see oil derricks. No houses, nothing in 1900. And so they came upon these things, they found some bones in them, and they realized, oh, interesting. What do we have here? And so these animals that they found, let me just show you some of the pictures of these fossils. This first picture is a picture of a fish fossilized from the ocean. Now, for you fishermen, would you like to take a hook out of that jaw? I don't think so. But I want you to note, look at the detail of the scales on this fish. Doesn't look like this fish decayed, had any time to decay. It was fresh, uh, quick frozen, not quick frozen, but quickly compacted and pressed into the dirt by, and by water. Next picture. Here's a reptile. So you have sea animals and you have land animals. Next picture. Here's a Tyrannosaurus rex. This they took out of the Librea tar pits. Now, how would you like to meet that bad boy? <laughs> I don't think so. Next picture. A woolly mammoth taken from the Librea tar pits as well. 28 feet tall. Is that a massive creature? Next picture. This is what they saw in the La Brea tar pits. These are the pictures of the animals that were oozing up through these tar pits. So they came here to drink. They drank the water. They died. They ended up in these pits. And so this is, the, I believe, one of the most incredible scientific, factual evidences of a global flood. Next, number two, sea animals are fossilized in the Alps, the Andes, the Himalayas, and the Rockies. Now, how do you get fossilized fish at the top of those mountains? Well, let me read to you from the World Book Encyclopedia. This is a, a book uh, that my wife and I bought 35 years ago, and I guarantee you, you're not going to find this information in any encyclopedia today because it's been removed. But this is World Book Encyclopedia, Volume 7, page 366. It states, Fossil shellfish indicate that rocks that contain them were formed under the ocean. Paleontologists find such rocks high in the Alps, Andes, Himalaya, and Rockies. They know that these areas were once underwater and were lifted up to form a mountain range. So, very clearly, in times past, this is what people believed. 
which is exactly what the Bible teaches. It says in Psalm 104, verses 5 through 9. Now, this is the New King James Version. It says, you, will, you, you who laid the foundations of the earth so that it should not be moved forever. You covered it with the deep as with a garment. The water stood above the mountains. Can't say it any clo- clearer than that. At your rebuke they fled. At the voice of your thunder they hastened away. They went up over the mountains. They went down into the valleys to, pl- to the place which you founded for them. You have set a boundary that they may not pass over, that they may not return to cover the earth. So there isn't going to ever be a flood again of the earth with water, contrary to those that believe in global warming. There is a future judgment to come, but as Peter says, that will be a judgment by fire. So it's a very clear statement. One passage of scripture in harmony with another. In Psalm 104 verse 8, the New American Standard Version, I believe, is the best version, the best translation of this text. It says, the mountains rose, the valley sank down to the place which you have established for them. So literally, the mountains rose up and the the or the valleys rose up and the mountains sank, literally. And so you have this, this is what took place during the global flood. And so when you see this, you see the result of these mountains having these fossilized fish and land animals together in the mountains. Next, uh, the next picture. This particular picture is of a great um, graveyard found in the Rocky Mountains. This is a graveyard of different animal bones that were found there. And so this, this is basically dinosaurs and other animals all buried together. Now, looking at this, why would they all be together? Because as the flood waters would rise, obviously the animals would go to a certain spot and they would all die together. That is why you find these all over the world. And I challenge you, if you don't believe that, just just Google the fact uh, fossil beds found around the world. There's plenty of evidence that you can find. Next picture. This is a fish that was found, a fossilized fish that was found in the Himalaya Mountains. How does a fish get into the Himalaya Mountains? Because it used to be underwater. Next picture. These are giant oyster uh, oysters that are fossilized. These were found at the 9,000 foot level in the Andes Mountains. Now, that would be quite a meal, wouldn't it? <laughs> Those are big boys. I have a couple of oyster, oysters that were given to me uh, that were found by uh, a fireman that was cutting a trail in the 5,000-foot level in the mountains here on the Central Coast. And I've got those in my office. How did those oysters get there? Next picture. Again, these are more fish that were found in the Rocky Mountains, fossilized there for you to see. Is there another picture? No, okay. All right, next evidence, three. The fossil graveyards that are found worldwide in the rocks of all geologic ages. Now, I say supposed geologic ages. Because this is one of the issues that scientists talk about, paleontologists speak about, the geologic column. You've all seen it in your science books. This layer is from this particular period. This layer is from another period. This layer is from even older, millions and millions of years ago. 
The only problem is, is that fossils are found in all of those supposed geologic ages. All of them. Sometimes there are individual fossils, like fossilized trees, that stick right straight through the geologic column. They're in like three different geologic columns. So how in the world did trees, are, how did they arrive at that particular place? The ideas, the, the surmising of these scientists, it means it's wrong. It's wrong conclusions. And so there are these massive graveyards. Next picture. Here is one of them. Let's see, this particular one is a massive graveyard in the Rocky Mountains. Again, the next one. This graveyard is a graveyard of mastodons, rhinoceroses, and elephants all together, the way they are found. So these massive graveyards, again, are a revelation that only a catastrophic flood could have brought about. These are fossils of land and sea animals all together in one place. Fourth, the mountains of Ararat were once underwater. It says in Genesis 8.4, it says, Then the ark rested in the seventh month, the seventeenth day of the month, on the mountains of Ararat. This is what the Bible declares. Now, Mount Ararat is about 16,000 feet high, okay? It's, there are two, there's the greater Ararat, lesser Ararat. These are on the eastern border of Turkey and Russia. These two mountains, uh, many scientists have traveled there and scaled these mountains over and over again. One scientist found what was called pillow lava at the 14,000 foot level of Mount Ararat. Now, why is pillow lava so important? Well, pillow lava, it's basically a rounded lava that forms underneath water. That's how it's formed. You can see, in fact, Google pillow lava. And you can see pillow lava today in some of the shallow areas of Hawaii. It is, there's a lot of it around the globe. Next picture. Here is pillow lava, 14,000 feet on Mount Ararat. Next picture. Again, more pillow lava, 14,000 feet. How does it happen? Because once Mount Ararat was under water. The fifth evidence. Dinosaurs and prehistoric creatures all died suddenly and were buried together. Now that is a scientific fact. I've shown you the pictures. These, these animals are found together all over the world. Now scientists will tell you that it was most likely a comet that came and struck the earth and created this huge uh, cloud of dust that went up into the atmosphere and this is what killed all of these animals. And that's a possibility. I'm not saying it's not. But what they don't tell you is the other possibility that there was a global flood. And so that is what I think is dishonest, is they don't even give you the option of that other idea. They just say, no, it was a comet. Well, how do they know? They weren't there. They didn't see the comet hit. They don't know. All we have is the evidence. And so we have to look at the evidence and draw conclusions from that. If there are sea and land animals together on the highest plateaus of our country, our nation, and, our, and every nation around the world, you have to answer, how did that take place? How did that occur? Now, the sixth evidence is Mount St. Helens proves that catastrophe can dramatically change the landscape in one day. Now, most of you were alive when Mount St. Helens erupted in 1980. 
Scientists say that the blast that occurred when that mountain exploded was 400 million tons of TNT being exploded at one time. It had the power of 33,000 Hiroshima bombs. It leveled 150 square miles of forest all around Mount St. Helens. You've seen the pictures. There isn't a tree standing. It's leveled. When you see pictures like that, you realize, whoa, that's power. That's incredible power. The little Grand Canyon that was formed just south of Mount St. Helens is a canyon that's about 150 feet deep that was formed in one day because of the ash that was laid down by pyroclastic flows, lahars, that came down from the mountain, the ash that was spewed out, and then the mud flows that came down that basically cut a canyon out of the dirt, out of these debris. So let me show you the picture. This is the Little Grand Canyon that was formed in one day, 150 feet deep. Next picture. This is the sediment that, this is the Little Grand Canyon wall. So you see, this looks very similar to another great Grand Canyon. And that's the reason why they call it the Little Grand Canyon. Because you see these sediments that were laid down all in one day. 150 feet of it. And then a canyon cut straight through it in one day. They say that the flow that came down, the mud flow that came down, came down at 100 miles an hour and cut this canyon out. Now, scientists that believe in a global flood, they love Mount St. Helens. They love this particular canyon because they say that this basically shows that the great Grand Canyon, the real Grand Canyon, didn't necessarily need millions and millions of years to be created. If you take the scenario of the mountains rising, the valleys descending, water coming off of the center of the, the United States of America, and it's flowing out to the oceans, the enormous mass of water could have cut that canyon easily in a very short period of time. That's what scientists believe. There are other scientists that would completely disagree with that. But this particular canyon shows you the evidence of what can happen in one day. That's powerful evidence. Number seven, another evidence is the oldest living trees on the earth are the Bristol Cone Pine Tree. Now, many people think that the giant sequoias are the oldest living tree, but they are not. They are only about 2,000 years old. But the Bristol Cone Pine trees are at least 5,000 years old. They have determined that simply by the ones that have fallen and just looking at the rings, the growth rings on them. 5,000 years old. Now, if that's the oldest living thing on the planet, that fits a flood chronology very easily, which I think is evidence, good evidence. If you look at the Spirit Lake below the Mount St. Helens, there are still trees floating in that lake that were destroyed. Some of those trees have the roots still attached to them. Some of them are laying on the top of the water some of them have turned straight up and down. Others have sunk all the way to the bottom and are being covered by sediment. And so this is most likely, most scientists believe this is how petrified trees can be found going straight through the geologic column. So these are, these are issues that I think are great evidence. Now, 
subjects that we can't cover this morning, could water really have covered the entire earth? Could Noah's ark really have taken enough animals to preserve every species on the planet? I don't have the time to cover it, but I can say to you, yes. There is no question. I've given you all of that evidence in our studies in Genesis 6 through 8. They're all on our website, calvaryag.org, under Media Archives. You can go there and get that evidence. But just briefly, all I can say to you is some of the ocean depths are beyond your comprehension. There are some canyons and valleys in our ocean that are 35, 40,000 feet deep. And this is, this is a scientific fact. So you say, could all the, all the earth really be covered? Absolutely it could. I mean, three quarters of the earth is covered by water. Only a quarter of the earth is land mass. And so with valleys ascending, mountains descending, it would be no problem for this to take place. Now, my conclusion, Peter's conclusion. Notice verse 7. The heavens and the earth, which are now preserved by the same word. In other words, the same word that declared there was a judgment coming, the warning given through Noah to the world that this judgment was coming, by the same word are reserved for fire until the day of judgment and the perdition or destruction of ungodly men. Now Noah was given a message and he proclaimed that message faithfully. He warned and people mocked. They did not believe him. The scientists that were around Mount St. Helens, they warned the people. They had seismic instruments that they knew this thing was going to erupt. They warned the people. But 57 people chose not to heed that warning. And they died. They were killed in the explosion and the pyroclastic flows that came down from that mountain. Some of you maybe have seen the video of the guy who was, he was just far enough to get away. But he's got his camera on running for his life. As you see this dark cloud come over the back of him. And he's, he's sweating because it's getting hot. But he was just far enough away that he survived. He had burns all over the backside of him from the heat. Barely made it with his life. And he was 10 miles away from the explosion. So I'm telling you, it's, it's, a, it's a warning that people didn't heed and they, they paid with their lives. So I'm saying to you this morning, this is your one and only warning. There is a judgment that's coming and you don't know when that judgment is going to come. This is what Jesus said. Let's read it again. Matthew 24, 37. As the days of Noah were, so also will the coming of the Son of Man be. For as in the days before the flood, they were eating and drinking, marrying and giving in marriage until the day that Noah entered the, flood, entered the ark and did not know until the flood came and took them all away so also will the coming of the Son of Man be. Then two men will be in the field. One will be taken and the other left. Two women will be grinding at the mill. One will be taken and the other left. Watch therefore, for you do not know what hour your Lord is coming. But know this, that if the master of the house had known what hour the thief would come, he would have watched and not allowed his house to be broken into. Therefore, you also be ready, for the Son of Man is coming in an hour you do not expect. I mean, Jesus gives here probably one of the most simple, obvious statements. If you were in your house and you knew a robber was coming, 
wouldn't you protect your house? Wouldn't you do something to stop it? Wouldn't you be ready? And he's saying, you have the same warning right now. This is what is going to take place. So you either believe it or you don't. I choose to believe it because I think Jesus is more authoritative than anyone. I take his, him at his word. So I hope that you do. Do you believe this? If you do, are you living like you believe it? If you live like you believe it, then you will obey him. You will follow him. If you live like you believe it, you will warn others, just like Noah did. You will warn people that there is a judgment coming. You will take them to this evidence and say, there's great evidence that there was a global flood and you've probably never heard this evidence. Would you think about it at least? Would you consider the evidence at least? I hope that you'll do that because the judgment is coming. It's as sure as the seat you're sitting on. Let's go to him in prayer. Father, we thank you so much that you love us enough to warn us. And Lord, it truly is a warning because, and it's a warning of love because you want us to be saved. You want us to turn. You don't want to judge anybody. And Lord, so I thank you for that incredible blessing. Lord, I pray that you would help us to share that warning with others. That judgment is coming. And Lord, you have paid the price for that judgment, that we can be saved, we can be forgiven, we can be delivered. Thank you, Father. And I just pray that if you're here this morning and you don't know Christ, you're not a Christian, that you will heed this warning and you will turn from your sin and you will come to him and follow him, receive him into your life. If I'm talking to you this morning, do you believe you're a sinner? Do you believe he died for you? If you do, then will you receive him? You say, how do I do that? Well, just pray with me right now. You have to ask him to come in and to take over your life. That's how you receive him. You do it by faith. And you do it by prayer. Just pray with me now. Just say, Lord, I believe I'm a sinner. I have broken your law. Forgive me. Jesus, come in. Take over my life. I want to be ready for you when you come. Fill me with your Holy Spirit right now. And change me. Cause me to follow you. If you just prayed that prayer with me, we just acknowledge that you did by lifting your hand here. Simple acknowledgement. Anyone here today? God bless you. Anyone else here? Lord, we pray you touch this heart, touch this life, transform by your power. Fill with your Holy Spirit. And Lord, we believe you're doing that right now. Lord, fill each one of us with your Spirit and Lord, just help us to have that, that hope and expectation for what is about to take place in, in our lives. And sooner or later, we're going to stand before you one way or the other, whether we die or whether we see, meet you in, as you come. And Lord, we, we are longing for that day. We commit ourselves into your hands in Jesus' name. Amen.